Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that it makes this program possible. While the Graduate Center at CUNY is now open for some classes, we are not allowed to hold any public events in the auditoriums. So this autumn semester, all our Leon Levy events will be on Zoom. Please note that we have two upcoming events. On October 27th, we are co-hosting a CUNY event on, quote, the three mothers, how the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin shaped a nation. This will feature author Anna Malaika Tubbs in conversation with Professor Robin Spencer. And on November 2nd at 6 p.m., Pulitzer Prize winning biographer Debbie Applegate will speak with Gerald Howard about her fascinating new book, Madam, the biography of Polly Adler, icon of the jazz age. Please mark your calendars and register for these free events on the Leon Levy website. Note that we have almost 10 events more this autumn, a very full schedule. So please encourage your friends and relatives to subscribe to our digital mailing list on our website. But tonight we feature a most unusual event, a roundtable discussion led by Ruth Franklin on the topic of scandalous biographers and their publishers. Ruth will be joined by Laura Marsh, Tim Dugan, Katha Pollitt, and Ian Baruma. Ruth Franklin is a former Leon Levy Fellow. Her first biography, Shirley Jackson, A Rather Haunted Life, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for biography. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in biography and a Coleman Fellowship at the New York Public Library. Laura Marsh is the literary editor of The New Republic and co-host of the Politics of Everything podcast. Tim Dugan is an executive editor at Henry Holt and Company, the books he has edited include winners of the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Women's Prize for Fiction, and many finalists for the National Book Award. Katha Pollitt is a poet, essayist, and columnist for The Nation. She has written for many magazines and published numerous books, most recently Pro, Claiming Abortion Rights, and The Mind-Body Prob Problem, a collection of poems. Ian Baruma, a regular contributor to and former editor of the New York Review of Books, is the author of, among other works, Behind the Mask, God's Dust, Playing the Game, and Murder in Amsterdam, The Death of Theo van Gogh, and The Limits of Tolerance. Our roundtable will run for about an hour, and then we will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box below to type in your questions and please direct them directly to the host. Uh, and Ruth will be sure to get to as many as she can. Um, again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And now I turn this conversation over to Ruth Franklin. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much, Kai. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here tonight. Um, thanks again, of course, to Shelby White, um, who is the uh, wonderful supporter of all of these events. I see that my video has turned off and I'm just gonna wait for that to go back on. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> so, and thanks to all of our panelists for being here. I'm sure this is going to be a fascinating discussion. So as we know, the title of this panel is Scandalous Biographers and Their Publishers. I want to start by um, just talking a little bit about the scandalous biography, as it were, that rocked the publishing world earlier this year. Um, of course, I'm thinking of Philip Roth, Blake Bailey's fourth biography, um, coming after his acclaimed and admired books about Richard Yates, John Cheever, Charles Jackson. Um, this book was preceded by significant buzz and was greeted with an admirable, um, quite remarkable press rollout, uh, a profile, a friendly profile in the New York Times Magazine, earned early and mostly positive reviews in many publications, including the New Yorker and the New York Times Book Review. A few of those early reviewers, including Laura Marsh, noted that the book seemed overwhelmingly sympathetic to Roth 
in ways that they found inappropriate, especially regarding his treatment of the two women whom he married. Within a week or so of the book's publication, some of Bailey's former students from a middle school where he had taught some years earlier alleged in the press that he had behaved inappropriately with them as young teenagers and later sought them out for sex, including one who charged him with rape. A publishing executive also alleged that he had raped her several years earlier and that she had reported the incident to Norton, Bailey's publisher, and I wanna say also Norton is my publisher as well. Norton apparently passed her complaint on to Bailey who is said to have contacted the woman to deny the claim and ask her to remain silent about it. Within maybe a week of all this coming to light, Norton had decided to suspend publicity and shipment of the initial print run of Bailey's book and canceled their plans to print more, a move that truly caused an uproar. Many people, even those who were disturbed by the allegations against Bailey thought this decision smacked of censorship and that it was unfair to punish an author for what were, after all, only allegations of bad behavior. Bailey has not commented publicly on any of this other than to deny the allegations. So I'd like to begin with the question, how does all of this look to you now, six months later? What could or should have happened differently? And what lessons can we draw going forward? And I'm gonna ask each of you to respond for just a few minutes with one or two of the points that seem most salient to you, uh, beginning with you, Anne. Okay, um, well, I think that th there is a law that um, bans writers from benefiting from their crimes. Uh, if they've been convicted, they're in jail. And I think that's an entirely appropriate law. Um, I'm very skeptical about withdrawing a book um, by an author based on allegations that hasn't been tried uh, in court, um, especially when the book is not specifically about uh, the crimes that are alleged to have taken place. So um, I think it set a very bad precedent. Now, you could compare it to moral uh, boycotts that have taken place in the past on political grounds, such as um, boycotting, say, so, uh, uh, um, oranges from apartheid South Africa or not going to the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel because it's owned by the Sultan of Brunei, who is a very a dubious figure politically. But then the question is, should is a publisher a business like a hotel or is it, can it be compared to uh, a nasty government? Uh, I think it can't, uh, but it is a business. And I think if publishers um, uh, respond to moral boycotts or to respond to um, uh, allegations made or objections made by a certain section of public opinion, and, there, and, and pull a book or don't publish a book will end up uh, with a very timid uh, culture, um, uh, which and, and it, it, it won't um, support uh, a lively or open uh, intellectual or literary culture. I'm sorry, do, do you want me to say more? Uh, I think that Ruth is on mute, actually. So she's trying to invite the next person to speak, but ah, okay. may need to be I'll on. take that. <laughs> okay, I'm muted. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Ian. Uh, Tim, please go ahead. Thank you, Laura, for your uh, clairvoyance. Uh, I, I agree with, um, with everything that Ian said. And I think, you know, from my perspective, as an editor, I can only look at it and, and sort of say there, but for the grace of God, because it's, it's such a horror show. Um, and it's, it's both, it, it's certainly without precedent and, and you have to just hope and pray that it, um, there, it, it doesn't set a precedent. And I don't think that it would just because the circumstances are so uh, awful and tragic and, and just, um, and exceptional. And I think there, it just raises a lot of questions because there are, there's so many things we still don't know. And I think maybe for the, for the sake of sheer decency, maybe we, we, um, shouldn't know just for the protection of the person who's who's at this you know the heart of this. I think 
ultimately what sort of tipped it um, is, is this um, allegation of rape. And I think it's um, what you do as a, as a company when you get, um, when you receive a note like that, um, I actually don't know. I don't know what the fire drill uh, is there in, in that circumstance. It's not just a legal question, but it certainly is. It's a potentially um, criminal um, act and you need to get advice of counsel, probably of outside counsel. And probably, I think the lesson, if there, if there is one, is, um, is, is for publishers to figure out how do you actually investigate this kind of thing? Um, because it sounds like it, it went through some sort of process. She alerted not just Norton, but the New York Times. So what did the New York Times do with this? Presumably they pursued it. Um, and, and we know to some degree um, how, how Norton pursued it. But um, you know, during the, um, the Me Too years when these were coming um, one after the other, you could see how these were investigated um, in different ways by different places. And I think it just shows that you have to you have to take it seriously and you have to in investigate it with as much kind of rigor and sensitivity as possible. And I'm, I'm sympathetic. I think it's extremely hard to, to find that balance sometimes. Um, so um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, there, I'm sure there are a lot. Norton is a publisher of tremendous integrity um, and the, as is the New York Times. And I'm sure they, um, you know, we're trying to, to find that balance and struggled with it. And I'm sure they look back on it and, and, and I assume think, I wonder what would have happened if we had done it this way slightly differently. Um, and I'm sure everyone is, is playing that game uh, and just guessing what would have happened if we had done something slightly differently. And, and we'll never quite know. But, you know, I think the, you know, the, the person who matters the most here in all of this is, um, is the victim. And I think the, the part that's probably the most, we can have a, a high-minded debate about, um, what it means for the literary culture, which is which is important and is valid, but I think the part that's the saddest of all is that um, you know she brought this um, allegation to a publisher, didn't get a response at all from the publisher, and then only got a response from the person who she was um, you know traumatized by, which then was re-traumatizing, um, which I think was is just brutal. Um, so I think it's a it's a wake up call, but I don't know that there are any really clear answers other than to just figure out um, when you see an instance like this, um, you, you just have to proceed both, both, um, you know, extremely carefully and sensitively, but, but thoroughly. Um, and, you know, I don't envy anyone trying to do that. Laura? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think there's the two things that I want to draw attention to are what you do to anticipate something like this, and then what you do afterwards. So I, I agree with Tim. Um, it does seem like there's no process in place for a publisher to assess a claim. You know, if someone comes forward and says, you have an author on your list who did such and such, um, I'm not aware of publishers having any sense of like how much they should investigate something like that, how they would go about it. Um, I think that it's not unreasonable to expect them to do something because in America, public publishing is run by like five very large corporations who have the resources um, to do something. Like, I don't think that publishers can say, we basically have two options, which is we either overreact in panic or we just ignore it, which seems to be the current situation. Like, you just ignore, 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 and then it all blows up and then you overreact and panic. Um, and it's unclear to me if something like this happened again, would any publisher be in a better situation to know what to do? I don't know. Um, I think something that was overlooked in all of this as it unfolded was who called for this book to be pulled from Norton? Um, I think there's a tendency to portray that kind of action as a publisher bowing to outrage or bowing to cries of cries for a boycott from Twitter mobs. And as far as I know, and I'm willing to be corrected, but as far as I know, as someone who was following this closely the whole time, I didn't see anyone prominent really call for this book to be pulled from Norton. I'm pretty sure I didn't see any of the women who had made allegations against Blake Bailey call for that. Um, in my understanding, Norton decided to come forward and do this. So I think that should be understood as the move of a corporation that was trying to protect its interests 
distancing itself from an author that it had backed. Um, and so I think when we talk about this and talk about a kind of chilling effect on publishing, if that's what you want to call it, that has to be taken into account. This was not some kind of mob justice, this was corporate action. Um, and then secondly, I think, um, moving on slightly from this debate about like what should happen to a book um, if the author is accused of terrible behavior, we could probably all agree that it wasn't necessarily ideal that someone in Blake Bailey's position be the biographer of Philip Roth and like have exclusive access to all of Philip Roth's papers and exclusive access to many of his friends, including people who have since died and can never be interviewed by another biographer. So I think one of the questions I come away from this with, which Ruth also raised in her piece in the New York Times, is what should happen to the remaining documents um, that the Roth estate has um, and what um, resources should be made available to other biographers who might be able to tell this story and add to it without bringing some of the attitudes that Blake Bailey brought to his version of Philip Roth, the biography. Great. Katha? Well, I went back and I read the column I wrote about all this when it happened. And I didn't think then that his book should be withdrawn. And I still think that. Um, I, I understand that it's a business decision and I know nothing about publishing as a business. Um, so maybe there was good reason from that point of view. And I do think, you know, well, publishing, publicity is mostly young women. And you wouldn't want to be the young woman who was in charge of the publicity for that book after these revelations came out. It would be very painful. And I know his, his book tour was being canceled all over. Um, but I still think that whether or not it was a, the great biography that Cynthia Ozick and Mary Carr before this happened said it was, um, it was still a book that someone might want to read. I wanted to read it. Um, and I don't see why it should be withdrawn from publication. And I'm glad that Skyhorse is there to publish all the old reprobates you know, who get canceled, canceled by their publishing house. There should be a place where, where you can take your, your reprehensible book and uh, by your reprehensible self and, and someone should publish it. And what, mostly what I'm struck by is how different the world we live in now is from the world of just a few short years ago. I mean, when you think Norman Mailer was acute, was stabbed his wife at a party in full view, William Burroughs killed his wife. Um, uh, Louis Althusser killed his wife. I mean, it's quite a thing. None of these people su suffered a professional or publishing debacle. Um, these things were all contextualized as, oh, very complicated, and uh, he was, she was insane, or he was insane, somebody had to be insane. Um, and now, uh, that would never, ever be tolerated. Um, and, and I, is that a good thing? I guess it is. It's a good thing from the point of view of justice and fairness, and certainly women and victims. Um, but think of all the books we wouldn't have by, Phil, by, um, by Norman Mailer, um, some of which were good. Um, that's, that would be a trade-off. So, I mean, it, just think how, how recently being a criminal was kind of a good thing for your literary career. Famous books by murderers, famous books by pimps and rapists um, that we, we don't even think about that, them in that way anymore. Um, and this is a different world. This is a world in which if someone says, oh my goodness, that line is anti-Semitic. This happened to Ellen Hillebrand, the uh, a popular novelist. And she said, oh, I'll change it. I'll change it. And there's nothing wrong with that sentence. It was fine. It was exactly the sort of thing that an obnoxious teenager would say in her book, um, making a joke about Anne Frank. Um, and now it's completely, completely different. And I think that there is a loss. Um, I'm not saying it shouldn't, shouldn't happen, because there has to be justice and there has to be equality and fairness and all that. But there is, I think there is a loss to, to, I don't know, free speech, the imagination, letting your thoughts run wild. 
um, maybe going over the limit. Um, so those were some thoughts I had. Another thought I had was how amazing it is that this book got these fantastic reviews, except from Laura. <laughs> Laura who was the person who, who saw it all coming. Um, and then immediately the biographer was revealed as accused of being this terrible person, the book looked completely different. The book looked like one terrible misogynist promoting the, you know, the work of another and making every possible excuse for him. Um, and that's fascinating to me. I can't really think of another example of a biography that, that met that fate. Um, maybe somebody out there knows, knows of another case. Um, and it made Philip Roth look different. Um, it made Philip Roth look like a much worse person. It made him look like the like Mickey Sabbath um, or Zuckerman at their worst. Um, and that is uh, very ironic because Philip Roth chose Blake Bailey precisely in order to make him look as good as it was possible within the limits of truth. Um, so, it makes sort of makes you wonder, should you not choose your own biography? Biographer, maybe not. Maybe you should let someone else do that. Okay, so those are some of my thoughts. Well, that is an excellent point for us here at the Biography Center. Um, Ian, I see you have your hand up. Did you want to respond to something that- Yes, I, I want to respond to something Tim said and also maybe Katha, um, as far as the, the role of publishers in this. Um, it's very possible that um, everything said about Blake um, uh, and or anybody else in that position is true. There is, of course, a precedent. It was Woody Allen's autobiography. And we're perhaps in danger of jumping to conclusions in that these are accusations. And we shouldn't simply conclude that because somebody is accused, it must be true. And I'm not sure that it's the role of a publisher to um, act as the police or the judge or district attorney. Um, the, if, if somebody commits a crime, rapes somebody or, some, or, or something of that nature, um, it should go to the police. It should, the person should be tried. I'm not sure this is the role of publishers simply on the basis of accusations uh, to act on them, even though Norton should not have simply ignored the letter that came to them. I mean, I, I, that, that, that is clearly wrong. But um, I don't think we should be judges. And the problem is not so much that things get withdrawn or pulped. The problem, I think, in future is that publishers will be very, very careful about what they publish, too careful. And they'll judge books whether they should be published or not, probably, partly on the basis of the personal behavior or what people say about a particular author, whether he or she is a nice person or not a nice person. If there's any risk of an author having done anything in their life that might be criticized, they won't publish the book. And that indeed uh, will mean that we won't have the William Burroughs or the Norman Mailers at all. And you get, a, again, I repeat, you get a very timid culture and something very odd has, has happened. And this is to Cather's point, uh, that in, I, I, I may say, our generation, oh, no. uh, it was people on the left of center, pu including publishers, who tended to provoke, to push the envelope, to see how far you could take freedom, to uh, deliberately do things that, that were unconventional and so on. And it was the right-wing establishment that was up in arms, the church and so on. Now, um, for good reasons, the left who are trying to change uh, gender relations and race, uh, racial things for the better. But now it's the left that have, are setting themselves up as the guardians of morality and, and, and what we regard as uh, just conventions and so on. And the provocations are gonna come from the right, which I don't think is a very healthy situation. Yeah, we've definitely seen a very interesting cultural shift as far as that's concerned. I do wanna point out actually that, you know, although Norton, technically, you know, said that they were withdrawing the book and stop publicizing it. I actually checked today, it is still on sale on Amazon. 
um, from both Norton and from Skyhorse. Um, and based on the sales rankings, it would appear that most readers are continuing to buy the hardback from Norton. So I would just say that it, it appears to me at least to have been a symbolic decision that didn't actually have any practical effect in the real world, despite the amount of, uh, of, of press that was devoted to it. I think you're right. I just came back from Amsterdam and they're piled high in the bookstores. <laughs> um, a victory for free speech, I suppose. Katha, did you want to respond? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, respond to something that Ian said, which is she should have gone to the police. Well. You know, we know that going to the police is, is a tormenting and horrible experience. Very few rapists are prosecuted. Very few are convicted. Um, most women do not go to the police. And there's a good reason for that. Um, there are all kinds of consequences that uh, should not be there, but are. Um, and so I, I think, you know, if he had, if she thought he had stolen her, uh, her jewels, <laughs> then I think you could say, well, why didn't she go to the police? But I think in the case of rape, it's more complicated. Um, and I understand why she and the other women would not do that. And we wouldn't be talking about this if she had alleged that he had stolen her jewels, right? Because that is a crime without the same sort of moral valence as rape. And the part of the issue is the the you know, supposed consonance of um, the allegations against Bailey and the way that they coincided with his evaluation of his subject, Philip Roth, and raised the question of whether he was an appropriate biographer to evaluate that subject. Yeah, Laura. Um, yeah, I, 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 just, I just wanted to object, um, Ian and Katha, you can put down your hands uh, if you're finished how speaking. Do, how so do I that, do that? Uh, in the same way you raised it. Oh, okay. Um, All right, go ahead. Oh, I see. Yeah, so I think, I think there is something relevant about the nature of an accusation. Um, I think some of the accusations from the middle school were not criminal. They were about forms of misconduct um, that a teacher at a school should not indulge in, but that I don't think that you could report to the police in many of the cases. And then I agree with what Kathy said about a rape allegation. Um, that's kind of a can of worms. Um, to speaking more generally, I don't want to speak to this case in general, um, in specifically, but if a publisher is told, you know, receives some kind of message from someone, the way Valentina Rice contacted Morton, about that kind of um, behavior, I don't know if that the publisher is in the position to be a moral jury or to investigate or police, like Ian was saying, but I do think there are two things that are relevant. One is a publisher is an employer with employees, right? So if they're working with someone who they have been told, you know, this happened, the publisher does have a duty to its employees to make sure that they are safe if they're working with that person. I don't know how they go about doing that, but that is something that they are obligated to bear in mind. The other is the nature of a biography as a book, um, as a project, is quite unusual. If someone's writing a novel, and people are saying they've, they've done all this bad stuff. That's kind of one thing because the people they are writing about don't exist, right? They've made up the novel, it's, an, it's all imaginary. If you were writing someone's biography, you're going out into the world talking to what, hundreds of people maybe, um, making lots of connections, going to archives, traveling around. And in this case, traveling around under the kind of calling card of Philip Roth. You have this imprimatur that's very powerful, that opens a lot of doors, gets people to talk to you. And I think, again, the publisher does have some kind of responsibility to be like, this person that we are putting our name on and giving our imprimatur and saying, yes, go and go out into the world and talk to these people. Like that should be someone who's like, who you can trust on a basic level. Um, and so again, I don't know how Norton goes about doing that. I don't know how a publisher goes about doing that. I think these are relevant concerns. You have employees and you also sort of have a basic duty to say, yes, this person who's going out interviewing people in our name is someone we trust. Tim, I wonder if you would like to respond to that as a publisher and an editor. Um, I think you, you use the phrase or someone used the phrase uh, fire drill about uh, in the sense that there 
whether about the game plan going forward were such a situation to happen. Um, you know, you it's obviously this is a feels like a one of a kind situation, um, but it's not unrealistic to think that something similar could happen, you know, with different change details, but a similar kind of controversy could well arise again. And I wonder if you have some kind of plan in place. Laura, I'd be interested in hearing that from you too, as an editor at the New Republic, what if this were uh, you know, a freelance writer or a staff writer for the magazine who was accused of some kind of crime, either you know, moral or intellectual or, or both? Tim, I'll let you start. Yeah, I think well, you know, the, when you use the word investigation, which we've all used, and I think that the um, circumstances call for something that's that serious. Um, on the other hand, I think Ian is right that, that I don't think these businesses should be acting like they're the police or they're the judge and jury. On the other hand, I, I, I think Laura is right too, and you have to, you have to find the balance there, which which any business and any especially um, any business that is um, in the realm of journalism um, or arts or publishing of any kind, you have to figure out um, you know how you're going to I, the word I would use is sort of due diligence. You have to, and, and when something like this comes, when a letter like a letter like that comes. That is, um, that's just a humongous wake up call. You can't do nothing about it. You can't, um, you can't fob it off and say, this isn't our domain. This isn't what we do. That's not going to work. You have to figure out how to, um, how to give it some sort of due diligence and how to uh, um, see it through step by step. But I don't think there is a, um, you know, part of what's hard about it is I don't, I don't think there's a template. I don't think there's something you can do and say, you know, when this happens, here's, here's the um, protocol we follow and it's steps one, two, three, four, five. I think you have to go through it step by step and and you're going to get surprised each way and you have to consult you have to you know create your own um sort of uh kitchen cabinet of a small circle of advisors and figure out how are we how are we going to deal with this because it's both it, it is a legal concern it is a publishing concern it's an editorial concern it's uh, i think what Laura put her finger on too it's, it's a trust concern both in terms of how you um how the your, your if the, the, the trust that the author has um in his sources and then the trust that the publication has in its readers and when something like this comes at this severe it's a, it's a breakdown of trust at every level and you have to figure out how to maintain that um i think that that's what it is um and i don't think there's a um a one-size-fits-all solution laura as an editor how do you respond how, how would how would you respond if this were one of your writers um well i think i agree, I agree with what tim said and i think also um you know Editors of magazine journalism do have to deal with issues of how does a reporter handle their sources, right? Um, and if the editor hears something about that that doesn't sound right, a reporter has developed a relationship with a source, let's say, um, then that's something that they have to take seriously and maybe the assignment doesn't work. If it's something more serious, magazines, newspapers, publishers are companies that have HR departments and people who are qualified to pick their way through these issues. I think the thing that you can't do is just ignore it and then have a panicked reaction when that turned out to be the wrong choice later. Ian, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I think that the other thing that complicates it is that there is a spectrum here. Uh, one is an accusations of rape, which is a crime. Um, but then there are also accusations of what people would call inappropriate behavior. What if somebody comes to a publisher with a brilliant book, but people uh, accuse this person of having used blackface when they were students? Now, it's very possible in the current climate that a publisher would then say, well, we'd rather not touch this because this is going to cause, uh, cause too many problems. Would it make a difference what the nature of the book was? Would somebody who was in blackface as a student, would it ma matter whether it was, say, a, a biography of Martin Luther King or if it was about, uh, I don't know, cricket? Um, so, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of, of asking publishers to be arbiters of these kind of things. I mean, I, I agree that if somebody is accused of rape and somebody sends a letter to the publisher, it needs to be taken seriously. But the publisher can't really simply assume that allegations are true and, that, and, and, and let that, set, particularly if, they're, if, it, if it's about behavior that is not criminal but, but questionable to many people. I th th my fear is that, that publishers are going to be become much too uh, frightened and um, it'll 
well, it'll stifle an in a potentially interesting culture. It, well, indeed, there's a story in the New York Times that just popped up a few hours ago about a um, Chinese American professor at Stanford who uh, had to, who uh, stepped down from the course that he was teaching um, after having shown his students, apparently on the first day of class, a clip of Laurence Olivier playing Othello in blackface, which understandably offended very many of them. This, uh, the professor happens to be a MacArthur uh, genius fellow, as well as the um, winner of many other accolades and is an extremely prominent person on campus. Um, he apologized apparently several times for having made this, having offended the students in this way, but he's uh, nonetheless stepped away from his class. I want to um, keep these questions, you know, in, in the backs of our mind about, you know, you all seem to agree that the publisher isn't capable of being the adjudicator, the legal adjudicator. Um, but um, in, in light of uh, what Katha rightly pointed out about how many victims of crimes, not just rape, but other crimes as well, don't go to the police, um, then who is going to be the adjudicator? Do we need to, and you know, this is why I think we find ourselves in the position of uh, trial by Twitter, as it's sometimes been referred to. But Kath, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, um, although now I don't really remember what I was going to say. Um, I think that, um, Norton could have taken it a step farther. I think what they did was they sent the publishing executive who claimed to be raped letter, email to him, to Blake Bailey. And he said, oh, I never did anything like that. And then he wrote to her and he said, I never, I never, never raped anybody. He says to the person who says he raped her. Um, and, uh, and my wife and daughter would be just dev who ado who adore me would be devastated if this got out. So um, I think that Norton did have an obligation to just take it a little further. They could have they could have explored it a little more. But I think that e that Ian is right that at a certain point things get kind of murky, um, and it's really hard to know sometimes um, what is going on. Um, I guess one thing I feel with this respect to the Chinese American composer, and that I think it was at University of Michigan, not Stanford that that happened, right. is why does everything have to go from zero to a hundred? You know, why can't it be this guy screwed up majorly? He showed this, this video of Laurence Olivier as in blackface as uh, Othello that was regarded by Bosley Crowther of the New York Times as racist in 1965 when it came out. Um, but why couldn't it just be everybody said, oh, my God, that's really terrible. Don't do that again. And then he says, oh, I'm sorry, I did that. And that's the end. Instead, what happened, and this is why you should be, why it's very dangerous to apologize, is his apology was not good enough. His apology encoded the very things they were complaining about, which is when he said, you know, I have basically I have black friends. <laughs> um, I'm not a racist. I have black friends. Um, so, uh, so then that led to another round. And, you know, it's true. He didn't lose his job. He'll be back next semester. Um, but I keep thinking, look, this was, this was a course in translating literature to opera. So it was Othello, Shakespeare's Othello and Verdi's Othello. So where is Verdi in all of this? You know, uh, I mean, what about the actual subject of the course gets completely lost? Um, and I think that's really, I think that's really a shame. I think that there had to have been some way of dealing with this that didn't turn it into this bonfire. Um, and I think that about a lot of these, these uh, things either on Twitter or not. It's just that why can't people just get along <laughs> as Rodney King said, you know? Why does it have to be like this? Yeah, we are living, it seems, in an all or nothing kind of climate. Um, I would love to uh, use the, your comment as a segue to kind of expand this conversation a bit beyond the specifics of the Blake Bailey, Philip Roth biography to, you know, the growing politicization of culture in general. But first, I see, Ian, you have your hand up. I wonder also if it's possible for uh, you, Ian, to turn on a light because you're yes. um, oh, oh, maybe oh, after oh, you make your right, um, Sorry. <laughs> um, not that I'm worth looking at, but it might be 
look less sinister. <laughs> Is that better? Yes, that's a good. Word. Yes. Okay. You want to make a comment? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that um, uh, Bright Sheng, the composer, uh, screwed up at all. I think it's grotesque that um, you should be, have to apologize for showing Laurence Olivier playing Othello uh, at a, in blackface, as was the, has been the convention um, in Shakespeare plays until very recently. And you can explain that to the students, but I don't think it's 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 uh, it's something that you should apologize for. It's in, it's entirely appropriate to show uh, one of the great uh, performances as as, a, as Othello. And I think the problem with that, and this perhaps takes it into a makes it into a slightly broader issue, as as you suggest, Ruth. The problem is that in this case is that it went straight to human resources as a Title IX case. Now, a Title IX case really should not be about showing Laurence Olivier playing Othello in a 1965 film. It should be about uh, unacceptable behavior. It should be about racism and so on. I really don't think that this, uh, I think Title IX is misused uh, in, in these cases and, and will have a very damaging effect. So I'd, yeah, I'd like to address more generally this question of um, censorship or self-censorship self by authors themselves. I think um, Ian may have used the phrase earlier the, uh, that we're creating a, a timid culture based on the fear of, uh, of being canceled, of, of being shunned uh, for you know, one misstep as this professor was. And so I wonder, um, I'd, I'd like to ask first um, Tim and Laura as um, editors and publishers, do you believe, do you know, see any signs that free speech is suffering under the growing politicization of the literary climate? For instance, Tim, do you, do you notice that the proposals that are submitted um, for potential publication are different in tone that they were, than they were, say, 10 years ago? Um, Either of you, do you think authors are less likely to take risks, um, political risks, or you know, aesthetic risks than they used to be? I, I can take a stab at it. I don't have a great uh, way of explaining it. It's a great question. It's something I think about all the time, and it's something that my colleagues and people in business talk about all the time, and it's something we worry about, and I think it's a, it's a serious concern. And something that is worth worrying about. I just it, part of what's so hard about it is it, it's impossible to prove a negative, and it's impossible to really measure. There's no way of really knowing whether someone is self-censoring or not. You just have a there's a feeling in the air, and so my sense of things is that there's both an opening and a closing happening simultaneously. So there's a kind of clubbiness in literary culture that is being opened up, which is healthy, and at the same time, there feels like there's kind of a chill in the air where people are worried about. Um, uh, saying the wrong thing or writing about something that um, there's a fear of cultural appropriation that is now so strong at this moment um, that it has a chilling effect. And so this, there are good things and bad things that come from both of these. And I think every day people are, and writers are trying to navigate it and figure it out. But I, it's, it's, you know, when you mentioned sort of the submissions, I look and I see, and I see all these things coming in. It's hard to find patterns though, actually. And it's hard to see, it's hard to sort of know what's not there. Um, but you do get, you do just get a, a very vague sense that there are probably people pulling back. On the other hand, for all I know, there are fewer people writing books uh, than there used to be. You used to see a sort of variety of things, and now, um, you know, you just don't. I mean, everything sort of feels like it's it's contracting in some ways. So there are lots of different forces happening simultaneously. It's very hard to to pinpoint, but it is a concern. It's definitely a concern. Laura, what do you see in your experience at the New Republic? Do um, writers feel fearful to you? Yeah, that hasn't been my experience at all, working with writers. Um, a really interesting piece I wanted to mention was there was this fantastic essay in The Nation um, about fiction writers having this tick um, of self-awareness where you see narratives in fiction saying things like, I know my problems aren't the worst in the world, but I really hate it when such and such as if they're kind of like preempting this idea that if they were to complain about, um, you know, their commute, that someone would criticize the novel for not being about, you know, extreme poverty or something. And I think that that's kind of a weird form of 
not self-censorship, but estranged positioning of a voice. Um, maybe taking up the idea that like I'm every all suffering is relative or the kind of on the scale. Um, but I don't know if that's self-censorship. I think that's just a weird sort of trend in fiction. Um, and one that's been quite thoroughly documented and is possibly on the way out. But one thing I actually did want to say was um, that my experience being an editor at the New Republic was that I found it exciting to be able to publish stuff when I first started editing here um, that wasn't being published elsewhere because other publications wouldn't want like a feminist take on a certain book or wouldn't want an anti-imperialist take on a certain book. And that was exciting. Um, and I guess my question for Katha is like, whether you felt like you were censored or shut out of certain venues earlier in your career for writing from a feminist perspective. Oh, what an interesting question. Of course, you don't know what you're not offered, right? Um, I think that it probably has happened. I think I've been sort of typecast a little bit, um, but, um, Nevertheless, she persisted and here, here I am. But yeah, I do, I do think that there's, you don't wanna be, as I said in my piece about um, Blake Bailey, you get tired of being that woman, you know, the person who always makes the feminist critique or it could be, you know, the anti-racist critique or the anti-imperialist critique. You don't wanna be so reliable because then you just feel like, all right, you know, okay, I'll do it. Um, and that's that's not very much fun for you. Um, so I think that now the uh, you do there are there are still I think there are as many things that you can't say in polite society as there ever were, but they're different things. Um, for example, look what happened to J.K. Rowling. Um, now, J.K. Rowling still has more money than God, and everybody still loves her and still reads her, but she was really put through quite a lot for saying, uh, objecting to the word menstruator as a synonym for women. Um, and you, you can't go against that. You cannot uh, really protest. If you're a turf, forget it. You are done in polite society. You, you want to sure, quote, on unquote. what that is for anybody? Well, okay. If you are a person who does not believe that a trans woman is just a hundred percent a woman, like like the, like you, Ruth, then you Rather, that, don't make assumptions about me and my. Sorry, gender. sorry. Okay, like me, I make assumptions about myself. Um, but if you say no, there are certain differences. You have different socialization. You have. Uh, a different different biology. Um, some things that happen to women are not going to happen to you, etc. You know, Caitlyn Jenner, blah blah blah. If you were to say any of those things, uh, or uh, let me put it this: the people who do say those things get in an enormous amount of trouble right now. Kathleen Stock at the University of Sussex is being needs to be escorted by police to her lectures um, because the students are so enraged that she's not down with the whole trans program. Um, so I think there are, there are lots of things you can't say. They're just different things than they used to be. Yeah, and I'm curious how you see this as somebody who's written a lot about um, politics in Europe, um, your, specifically your book about um, Thea van Gogh and um, tolerance in the Netherlands, how you would compare the situation in Western Europe say to the situation in the United States right now as regards what uh, what Katha is saying right now about these about the orthodoxies the liberal orthodoxies that have come to prevail mm -hmm. well no I, I, that, that is a very interesting question I was just going to, before you asked the question I was just going to point out one particular instance of where uh, we clearly see a kind of censorship at work through for, for entirely financial reasons but um, there's a wonderful film about the Dreyfus case. That film has never been shown in the United States because it won't be, nobody will distribute it. Why? Because it was made by Roman Polanski. And uh -huh. I think adults in the United States should have the, the, the right to see this film. Anyway, that said, 
I think that does say something, answer your question to some extent, because it's, it strikes me that this orthodoxy and the, the culture of apology and public confession and, and disgrace and so on is particularly strong in English speaking countries. It's strongest in the United States, but it's not much less strong in Canada and Australia and also in the UK, much stronger than it is say in France or Italy or let alone Japan or uh, anywhere in Asia. And my view, and I'm sure it can be contested and other people have different views, my view is that it has something to do with the kind of Protestantism that is uh, very strong in American uh, culture. And that the Catholics, when they sin, uh, they confess to their priests, but they don't make a great public issue of it. Pro there is a strong tradition since the Reformation when in Protestantism, when you've transgressed, that your re-entry into the community has to follow a public confession and a public um, affirmation of the purity of your faith. And I think what we're seeing today in the United States in particular is a kind of religious, a secular version of a religious fervor that is not unknown in US history. I want to remind um, people who are watching us that um, you're welcome to submit questions via the chat. They will be passed on to me and um, I will pose them to our palace. In the meantime, um, we have a contribution from Kai who raises the question of um, whether, for instance, a classroom should be a quote unquote safe space um, where uh, students have uh, oh, the right to their expectation that they won't be exposed to ideas that they find disturbing, traumatizing, and so forth. And Kai uh, draws the analogy, and I think this is an interesting one, to the publishing industry. Um, do publishers also feel that they have an obligation to keep their readers safe? And if so, safe from what? Is this something, and I throw this out, out to all of you in your different roles as participants in that industry. Um, I'm happy to go first. So I, I am not a publisher, but as a answer of criticism, I think um, I'm more interested in a vibrant culture of criticism where people can read a book and say, this sucks quite openly. Um, and to bring it back to the Philip Roth biography, I felt like so many of the positive reviews of that book were by people who just didn't read it. And it's completely understandable to say there's a biography of Philip Roth and this is just the occasion for my big essay on Philip Roth and I'm not gonna engage with the biography. But I think that explains the phenomenon Katha pointed out that people seemed to say after Blake Bailey was accused of certain things, oh, the book's completely different now. And I just think, no, it wasn't. It was always a pretty bad book. Like it was always a sexist book. It was always a really biased, poorly constructed book. A book that at the same time contains a lot of information. And I think, you know, people will want to consult it to get that. But I think that more important than um, necessarily, I, I, not more important than the publisher, but I think that critics have a very important role in making sure that we can actually discuss whether ideas are worthwhile or not, and whether they've been framed in an intelligent way. Um, and I think it's better to have a decent debate about some of that stuff than to just say, yeah, we can't, we can't talk about this biography. Either it's the best thing that's ever been written and is, as Cynthia Ozick said, on par with Dostoevsky, or it's total trash. And maybe it's just like a mediocre book that was 900 pages long and very sexist. Um, I, I would just say, I think that um, from, a, from a publishing point of view, thankfully, I, I don't think there's really a link between what I is pointing to and the sort of safetyism um, within academia and, and, and within schools and, and in publishing. The, the closest thing to it would probably be in, um, in uh, uh, children's and young adult publishing with sensitivity readers. And that's something that's been a phenomenon um, in, in recent years, particularly in fiction that, uh, that hasn't really crept up in adult publishing. It hasn't made its way into, into what I do. 
and I think there probably should be um, some line of demarcation there too. I'm in favor of doing um, all different kinds of, of review and of peer review, but it usually I think it's, it, you know, as an, as an editor, you want to do it to make the book better, whatever that means, um, to make it more accurate, to make it tighter, to make it read better, um, to make it more potent or powerful, um, or to find some of its flaws and to smooth them over or remove them somehow. Um, those are all kind of editorial functions, but I, I don't really think that in kind of quality literary adult publishing, you should really be vetting things in terms of how not to offend people. Um, let's see, how do I do this again? Um, Katha, yes, I see you. I did it, I did it. Um, but you know, having said all these things that we've said, there is the other side of it, which is that we are going through a his, historical reckoning of tremendous importance. And, you know, mentioning um, children's books, um, I happened to read a wonderful book that really changed my views of George and Martha Washington. And it was um, uh, about the escape, I'm blanking out on the name, but it was about a slave who had escaped from them and their own a judge and their tremendous efforts to get her back while preserving their reputation. It was really quite shocking. So anyway, uh, around the same time as I read that book, I came across uh, a book called something like A Birthday Cake for George Washington, which was about a slave, Hercules making, or enslaved person, I should say, um, Hercules making, who was a, a great, his cook, who was very a uh, wonderful cook, making a birthday cake. And it never mentioned that he was a slave. Um, it didn't mention that he escaped. Um, it was just a complete, you know, hey, geography, a nice little story about George Washington and his birthday. Then I read another book called George Washington's Dog, a children's book that was all about George Washington and his many dogs and how much he loved dogs and some noble thing he did involving a dog. And never mentioned, there was not one picture of a Black person in that book from start to finish. You would never know that George Washington had slaves. And I think that's really wrong that we, we just have to reconfigure our notions of American history to place slavery as a central thing. And we don't do that. Um, we're beginning to do it now because there's a lot of wonderful history co coming out. But um, I don't think with children's books, we're really, we're at the beginning of that, I think. I think that's part of what makes all of these questions so hard to answer more generally speaking, is that we live in a literary culture that you know, at times may seem polarized to us from certain perspectives, but at the same time is extraordinarily diverse. Um, we, you know, we live in a literary culture that has room on the one hand for books about enslaved people who are happily baking cakes and on the other hand, you know, and, and those books will be criticized and rightly so for not realistically portraying the conditions of the lives of slaves. And then at the same time, we live in a culture where um, somebody who writes a book about Ona Judge, George Washington's runaway slave, is going to be criticized from a quite different perspective but for, um, you know, put our offering that information for, for portraying one of the founding fathers in that way, in such a negative way. And so I, I guess I ask all of you, how do we move on from here as, as writers, as editors, as critics? What is our role, if any, in uniting the two sides of this extremely polarized culture? And it, it, you know, is that something that you think about at all in the work that you do? And if not, do, do you consider the politics of, you know, our, of our current moment, this, this era, this post-Trump era and whatever that means in America right now? Um, do you consider that? Does that play, play a part in your mind as you do your work? Who, who do you want to answer this whoever, question? Whoever wishes to answer that question. Well, I think th th one's role, why do you write? You write, first of all, because it's a way to force yourself to think. 
um, in a world of, of, of chaos and inchoate uh, things. And you, it forces you, you, you to impose a certain order in your mind and things. And that means um, also thinking outside, trying to f face um, views that you don't necessarily hold. And you also write to make other people think. You don't write to make people feel comfortable or to, um, uh, to make them feel safe. If they feel uncomfortable, unsafe, because they're exposed to ideas that they're not familiar with or they don't that rub them the wrong way or something, that's the price to be paid for uh, an, an open culture uh, where things can be debated and aired and, and where people can be forced to rethink their positions. And the fact that this is becoming a slightly risky enterprise uh, worries me. So to that extent, yes, I do think about it, but um, I try not to let it worry me so much that it, um, it paralyzes me or makes me feel that I should sim simply go away and tend my own garden. Um, yes, I, I just want to make a little correction, which is that book about uh, the birthday cake for George Washington was withdrawn from publication. And if you go on Amazon, it will cost you $91 to buy a used copy. So, so and I think that was the right decision. Um, I think that that's a falsification of history. Um, and uh, as for your question about how can we can all come together, I, I think that's probably pretty hopeless. And as a writer for the nation, it's not my job. <laughs> my job is to heighten the contradictions. Well, I think that's a vital role too, and, and long live the nation, we need it. Um, I, I think from my perspective, you know, I, I publish lots of different kinds of books and, and nonfiction and fiction, and all I really try to do, and I think most of um, my peers do as well, is, is a book should kind of open your eyes and it may or may not change your mind, but it might just slightly um, you know, change your perspective a tiny bit and it might not do it overnight while you're reading the book. It might do it a year later, it might do it five years later. Because um, books, this is part of what in, in book publishing I think goes against the culture right now is, is it's a very fast moving, probably too fast moving culture. The metabolism is just off the charts and books are moving at a completely different speed. And so I think um, the, the best thing we can do and hope to do is to try to publish um, you know, a, a range of, of voices and, um, and not sort of lose kind of the art of persuasion um, and to do it sort of subtly. I do feel like there's not a ton that's, um, I feel like the, the, the concept of persuasion at all is, is sort of out of fashion at the moment. And that's not the healthiest thing. Um, I think that books can, our books are vital um, and, you know, from whatever perspective they're coming from, we're having a long overdue reckoning now um, in terms of diversity in a country that's itself very diverse and, and we need it, but you also have to have, um, you know, diverse voices and diverse um, ideas as well. Laura, do you want to comment or shall we move on to questions? Um, yeah, I bet my comment would just be very short, I think, which is I think that in criticism, it's important to actually read the books that you're reviewing and try and make the most rigorous argument about them you can. So that um, segues nicely to a question we have about the role of literary journalism in all of this. Um, the questioner brings up um, the role of the New York Times in the Blake Bailey controversy. Um, at, seems to cast blame on the Times for publishing uh, Cynthia Ozick's letter review of the book and uh, wonders if the Times coverage was affected because um, one of the daily book critics, uh, Dwight Garner was uh, peripherally involved in the allegations against uh, Bailey. I don't know if anybody here wants to comment specifically on the role of the New York Times, but I, I think this speaks to um, Laura's comment about how the job of a critic is to evaluate rigorously. And as a biographer, I would point out that um, biographies um, often don't get reviewed in quite the same way that, for instance, novels get reviewed. Um, it's often, um, and I think we saw this collapsing of 
author and subject in the Blake Bailey controversy, but the reviews of a biography are often much more about the subject of the biographer of, of the biography than they are about, for instance, the bio, the biography's quality as a biography per se. That is, you know, what sort of research did the biographer do? Um, what sort of sources did they use? How well did they integrate those sources into a coherent portrait of a subject, if that's in fact what they were trying to do? Um, and so I wonder, I wonder if any of you want to comment on uh, the role of critics in the Blake Bailey controversy or more broadly in uh, other uh, problems that have arisen in our in, in literary culture. Well, if it's about the New York Times specifically, uh, yeah, I do have something to say. I'm a great admirer of the New York Times for its um, foreign correspondence, for its coverage of the news and so on. I think its arts coverage is pretty appalling because it's a sort of combination of pomposity and bending to, the, to prevailing winds and not offending anybody uh, and so on. And somebody mentioned Bosley Crowther just now as um, having written uh, a negative, negatively about Laurence Olivier's performance as Othello. When you look at um, great and controversial films on Criterion, and then you read what Bosley Crowther said about them, he was almost always entirely wrong. But at the time, people probably thought that um, uh, he was right because they have an unfailing, uh, they're a weather vane, they have an unfailing uh, way to find exactly what most readers might think. And nodding heads is the last thing you want with interesting criticism. In some ways, I think as a writer and a critic, it's much more interesting to write against your audience, to challenge what most people who read you might think, or, or, or and, uh, because that stimulates thinking. I think the New York Times very often does exactly the opposite in its criticism and its arts coverage, not necessarily in its news. More generally, is there, is there an issue with criticism that doesn't do enough to challenge the prevailing way of thinking? You're asking me? I'm asking everyone in general. Is that the role of criticism? To, to what? To Sorry. challenge the prevailing way of thinking. I think interesting criticism always challenges and, and the prevailing way of thinking. I mean, this is why somebody like Elizabeth Hardwick, Hardwick was such a great critic and why she was so critical at the time in the 60s of um, the New York Times criticism. And uh, that, yes, you have to challenge. And I think Laura was making a similar point, although I'm not sure I agree with her that writing uh, from an anti-colonial perspective is a particularly challenging or adventurous thing to do anymore. But I think challenging any um, sort of uh, preconceived notion or prejudice or uh, commonly held notion that, that is open to criticism is a good thing. Katha, Laura, do you want to respond to that? I think that... Um writing against the book or against the audience can become a little bit too easy. Um, and I actually don't like writing negative reviews because I think it's so easy to work your argument up when you're taking someone down. Uh, and I would always try to pull back from that. I think, but I think what is interesting is um, to try and challenge the audience by showing them an aspect of a writer or a subject that they might not have appreciated otherwise. So that could be the same thing, challenging the reader, but not necessarily in that every piece has to say, everything you knew about this is wrong. You know, um, George Orwell said that the hardest thing about reviewing books was sort of working yourself up to care about some just okay book. Um, and that's certainly the way I, 
I feel. So they're like, okay, it's another book. Enjoy. You might like it. Um, and that's one reason I stopped writing reviewing books, except when I felt, you know, really passionately about it one way or the other. Um, I find that I would want to say that books are treated very gen generously especially in the New York Times. There are a lot of positive reviews there. But then I think, hey, Katha, you got one. You've gotten several. Uh, <laughs> um, and a, 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 a negative review is quite devastating, and I understand, which I also received. And uh, I can understand why, if you think about that from the writer's point of view, you would want to be a little careful. Um, and the idea of holding up the book is here's an example of everything wrong with the world today is, is a kind of frightening prospect. Indeed. And, you know, I think probably uh, everyone who's a writer has had the experience of being on the receiving end of a tough review at some point or other. Um, I, I wrote about my own experience um, being on the receiving end of a tough review from Blake Bailey of my book about Shirley Jackson, um, a review that um, felt to me unfair because um, it struck me as having um, as uh, as not being a an intellectual criticism of my book, but uh, but being rooted in sexism. He accused me of not having um, been sufficiently generous to um, Jackson's husband, or not having been sufficiently sympathetic of his um, infidelities, and having taken Jackson's side too much, which then struck me as uh, quite ironic later when uh, I saw how um, um, strenuously Blake had taken Philip Roth's side in his own biography. Um, but, you know, leaving aside, you know, the unpleasantness of um, being on the receiving end of a negative review, I wonder, do any of us, uh, truly believe that um, the climate has turned against negative reviewing. Um, you know, it's something that comes up often in terms of, you know, social media, that there is this uh, kind of this culture of support where everybody's chums and friends with everybody else. And uh, there's, an, and, um, you know, there are many writers who say that they, not just that they don't like writing negative reviews, but that they decline to do it altogether. Um, is this, does this strike you as a symptom of our, of the timidity of our literary culture? I find it really bizarre when people claim that the negative review is dying out. It happens periodically, um, and it seems to have been happening maybe forever. Um, thinking back to like Elizabeth Hardwick's decline of book reviewing, people have always complained about a culture of soft, soft reviews and anti-intellectual reviews, and I think that has always existed. But I think at the same time, a culture of strong criticism has always existed too. And it seems to me that this is almost entirely what most people read when they read book reviews. It's much easier to get people excited about some critique than it is about a positive review. Um, I think you see people passing those kinds of pieces around much more often. And I think that's not just because people like a fight, but also because a negative review by its nature shows you a debate because it shows you both for and against. Instead of just explaining the argument of the book, it also responds to it. And so I think even people who don't agree with the critique get a lot from those kinds of reviews because they're actually getting to experience discussion and a debate. Um, so I, I don't think there's timidity. I see negative reviews all the time, publish lots of them, and envy many of the other reviews that are published in other publications that do a good job of forcefully critiquing books. Katha? Um, I think one thing that happens and that is connected to what I see as largely positive reviews, um, except in the New Republic, <laughs> and the nation um, is that there's a feeling in certain areas of liter of book publishing that you need to support the genre. You need to support, for example, poetry. You need to support poetry. It's all about 
you know, or you see that in theater reviews. Sometimes, you know, we need, you need to support the theater. The theater is in trouble. We need to get people to go to the theater. Um, and so I think that's a thing that there's a, a fear that negative reviews will harm the whole area of, um, of writing. And I think there's also a lot of cult stuff. I mean, can you write a review that says, you know, actually science fiction is kind of stupid, you know, the sort of who cares who killed Roger Ackroyd that um, Edmund Wilson wrote long ago. No, now genre fiction is, you know, uh, is held up as, you know, perfectly, you know, valid and interesting and wonderful. And here's another book that's just, you know, just great. Um, and so I think that um, there's a lot of just promoting certain areas of writing. But don't you think that's always existed? Well, I don't know. I'm not that old. Um, um, I think it probably has always existed and it's still here. That's all. <laughs> Ian, I'm curious how this debate played out for you, if at all, when you were editor of the New York Review of Books. And I see there's another question about um, polit about politically motivated reviews in criticism. Uh, Katha just brought up, you know, that it's no longer um, possible to criticize genre fiction. I don't know if I totally agree with that, but I think it, you know, it certainly is not a counterintuitive argument anymore. Um, what about, you know, do uh, writers of color get treated differently from white writers, for instance? In general or in my experience? In your experience. As an editor, no, I didn't think they were treated any differently. They certainly shouldn't have been. I mean, I think um, a writer is a writer, whether they're, they're black or white. Um, also, when I, when I spoke about timidity, I didn't necessarily mean the lack of negative reviews. Um, I meant really the, the challenging, this could be in the form of a positive review, but challenging the received opinion of most of your readers. I think that's, an, that's not the only thing a magazine should do, but it's, it's an essential thing a ma magazine should do or a publisher, I think, because that's what make, gets people thinking. I, I, again, I'm, I don't want to be a bore on this subject. I totally take Laura's um, point that writing, say, uh, from an anti-colonialist point of view is, is important and interesting, but in some ways it would be more um, thought-provoking if somebody wrote a very intelligent piece for, say, the New Republic. Um, point, I'm not saying that, this is, that I would be that person or that I would agree, but pointing out, say, the positive aspects of certain colonial histories. I mean, that would be uh, more adventurous, let's put it that way. And, Christopher Hitchens uh, did that. I'm sorry? Christopher Hitchens used to do that. Well, that's that's one reason why he was, even though I had a lot of issues with Christopher Hitchens, as we both know, uh, that was why he was in some ways valuable. But um, so, but if you ask me specifically, my experience as an editor, and Kai was kind enough to introduce me as, as a regular contributor to the New York Review, then alas, that's not the case anymore. But um, as an editor, I did try and, and, in, and sort of, have people, have writers, and, uh, um, and I don't mean the writer that led to my dismissal, but writers sort of challenge the views of um, many readers of the New York Review, and that was not always popular in the office. Hmm. Laura, Katha, do you have a sense that that applies more generally? Um, is it a problem for writers who try to challenge the um, general political tendencies of a magazine? Well, I'll have to write a column to test that theory. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of freedom at The Nation. Um, and uh, I actually don't know how far it goes. <laughs> um, the I haven't been made to change anything for political or social or cultural reasons since, and I'm not kidding, 1980, maybe 19, 1995 or six. Um, 
So, and I don't feel that. That seems like a very specific date. Are you thinking of a particular <laughs> instance? I am, but I'm not going to tell you about it. Uh, uh, um, I made a joke that misfired, um, as jokes sometimes do. Um, and uh, it, and it was changed, and I didn't understand why at the time. But you know, with 25 years distance, I can sort of see their point. Um, but uh, I don't see myself as completely on board with everything that's everything political in the nation. And I have disagreed with things a lot. Um, I don't believe, for example, just to choose one example, I don't believe that America is a left-wing country that is being suppressed by Republican shenanigans. Um, I think it, it is a center, I think it's a center-right country with, uh, with some leftists. Um, and that's not the official, or not, I wouldn't say official, that's not what most people around the nation think. Um, I think they, they have a much more positive and hopeful view than I do. Um, so, so there's that, I'm always banging on about that. Um, so, um, so that's, I, I, you know, we'll see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to write something really shocking now, though, just as a test of my- of my Or do you want to comment on uh, on that question? Um, well, I, I definitely think it's a mistake to assume that you know, people who work at a magazine like the New Republic or the Nation all agree with each other um, on everything. Certainly, that's not the case. Um, but insofar as like, would we publish something about the positive aspects of colonialism? I can't imagine that because I don't know what those would be. Um, so I think. I mean, like Katha said, when you work for a magazine like TNR or The Nation, our job is to heighten the contradictions and to make the case um, for certain positions sometimes. And I don't think it's our job to indulge in a kind of reflexive contrarianism just for the sake of bucking the expectations of our readers. Well, this has been a really fascinating and far-ranging conversation, and I'm grateful to all of you for being so um, provocative and engaged with this subject. Um, I want to invite Kai to come back for a moment to address a question that's uh, specifically directed at him. Kai, are you out there? There you are. You need to unmute. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So there's a question to you um, on the, along these lines of uh, censorship and self-censorship um, about um, why a video from the Levy Center done uh, with Blake Bailey um, in, on April 15th of this year, why was that video deleted? Do you wanna answer that question? Right, yes, good question. And it was most unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> because in my view, that was, we had Blake Bailey on uh, in conversation with Mary Carr. Uh, and it was a really interesting conversation, uh, both at the time and in retrospect after the scandal broke. And, uh, and yet there was uh, a question posed from the university oh, maybe we shouldn't have this up in the aftermath of the, quote, scandal. And uh, I push back, but unfortunately, we do not normally, we do not ever sort of ask all our participants, we haven't asked you guys to sign a waiver saying, giving us permission to post a recorded video. And we hadn't asked Mary Carr or Blake Bailey. And when I asked Mary Carr about this in the wake of the scandal, she was embarrassed sufficiently enough about the, uh, her role in that conversation that she didn't want the video posted. Uh, so you can't see it on our Leon Levy website, but happily it was up there long enough that it's already been posted on YouTube and you can go and see it there. So. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm uh, sort of gratified for that. Uh, so just yeah, just reminding us all that we live in a world where nothing can ever truly be deleted. It, it hasn't disappeared. 
Um, hi, I wonder if you want to, as a biographer yourself, I wonder if you want to respond, uh, comment on any of the issues that the panel raised. Well, I think this has been a fabulous discussion. It's very important. I'm uh, personally, uh, you know, opposed to the cens censorship by a publisher or self-censorship by students in a classroom. I think you know people should be exposed to difficult and uncomfortable ideas, and um, you know our our mistakes intellectually should be exposed. And uh, so you know Blake Bailey's uh, biography, I think, as people have admitted here, is something to be read. And it is going to be read by many people. And yet Laura's criticism of it at the time uh, has also proven to be uh, prescient and apt and on the mark. You know, here was a biographer who, uh, interestingly enough, gave you all the ammunition in a way for if you were critical of Philip Roth's uh, womenizing, the evidence is all there. And yet he also maybe excused it or seems to excuse it in the narrative. So it's, the book should be read and, uh, you know, the interview that we had with Blake should be viewed and, uh, you know, a thousand flowers should bloom in my view. <laughs> All right. Well, on that happy note, um, I, I'll just say thank you once again, um, Kai, for hosting this conversation. And thanks again to Shelby White for her support of the Leon Levy Center. And thanks to each of you, Katha, Laura, Ian, and Tim. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. Good night, everybody. Thank you for having Good us. Thanks so much. Good night.